and a warm welcome to another episode of Lifting Lowdown, a podcast brought to you by Lift and Hoist International. My name is Guy Harris and I'm the publisher of LHI, the magazine servicing the global industrial lifting sector. This is where I invite people from the industry in joining me to cut through the formality and discuss topics in a relaxed and friendly manner. Let's get to know this week's guests. I am joined again by Richard Howes of Bridger Howes, a PR and consultancy firm prevalent in the lifting and materials handling sectors. Rich is rapidly becoming a co-host of Lifting Lowdown and should need no further introduction to regular listeners of this programme. However, in this episode we are also joined by his business partner Mark Bridger. Having followed his father into media in 1990, Mark has 30 years of experience in sales and leadership positions across events, media and publishing portfolios. He has occupied a number of roles in a variety of industries, including metal forming and fabrication, building and construction, as well as heavy lifting. Involved in all aspects of media sales, from events to publications, direct mail to digital, he has researched, launched and directed a number of international exhibitions and conferences in Europe, the Far East, the Middle East and North America. Mark even spent three years based in the US as publisher and director of business development for a media portfolio covering lifting equipment. Now, with Rich, he heads up Bridger House after its launch in 2014. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to welcome Tad Dunville. Tad is a third or fourth generation crane guy. He is a Miami University finance graduate and also studied and graduated in law at Kansas University. He is a former Vice President of the Crane Certification Association of America and current ASME B30.2 committee member. Starting out at Dearborn Crane with a broom and shovel, he left as Chief Financial Officer. Tad has occupied the role of Director of Corporate Development at Ace World Industries and is currently the General Manager of AirPes Americas. He also gives talks about crane design and safety from Europe to Argentina. Readers of LHI will also know Tad as the magazine's original insider columnist. Welcome to Lifting Lowdown, guys. Hi. Thank you. Good to be here. Hello, everyone. Hello, lads. Thanks for joining us. Um, So as regular listeners will know, this podcast does not take the format of a straightforward interview, but invites industry representatives to openly discuss key topics. And a subject briefly touched upon in our previous episode is the two types of people one typically finds in the lifting sector. Those that have drifted into the industry and those whom have inherited companies or a passion for the business through family connections. At a time when lifting, like so many traditional industries, is crying out for new blood, we thought we'd tackle the topic, compare and shed some light on both routes into our sector. Let's begin. Rich. For continuity and recognition of the concept for this episode's conversation, let's start with you. On our last outing, you spoke of two types of people you tend to come across in this industry. Can you expound on that? Yeah, of course. I think at the time we were talking about Global Lifting Awareness Day, weren't we? So we were talking about uh, how we can better promote our sector, which is one of the key objectives of that initiative. And I think we we were talking about, in kind of my experience, the two types of people that that you reference, which is either seems to be those who followed grandfathers, fathers, mothers, or family connections into family-owned businesses, um, or it seems to be people who found themselves here somewhat by accident. Um, The interesting thing, as we discussed about the The latter scenario is that those people who who stumble here, myself included, um, tended to to do so um, as a bit of a stopgap and end up kind of sticking around. Yeah. Um, So I think as as, as what we were talking about was it it kind of sums up the challenge and the opportunity of our, our sector really is people either come here by accident or they follow a relative um, and, and yet when they're here they kind of have tremendous fun and, and stick around and I know both Mark and Tad who are on on this episode with us to some extent followed um, fathers into into their respective lines of business um, so it's going to be interesting hearing what what those guys think and um, and then kind of seeing if we can uh, plot plot a plot a bit of a, a, a route map or route map as as Tad would probably say just to <laughs> Um, 
kind of see where this industry might uh, might might be going and the people that are going to take it there. Agreed. Uh, so, Tad, which is it? Third or fourth generation? Uh, it, it depends on how you define that. So my grandfather uh, with his brother started a crane company in, in the late 40s, right after the war. Uh, but his father, uh, which would be fourth generation, was the, uh, the plant engineer at Kelvinators in Detroit, which uh, re refrigeration was a high tech business uh, at one time. So we like to think of him as, as a 1920s tech guy, right? Um, but he was responsible for quite a few uh, cranes and, and lifting equipment uh, in, in the 20s and 30s. So depending on how you define a third or fourth generation. Okay. And tell us a little bit about your father, if, if you don't mind. Um, I, I, I know Larry has, uh, well, your, your father, Larry Dunville, of course, is the, the former CEO of a national crane builder. That's correct. And, and so uh, he, he's, he's a, a great guy and, and very knowledgeable and, and, and uh, sold out quite a while back now, but is still uh, very active in the profession and, and does a lot of work with uh, uh, agencies and organizations that write standards uh, and also uh, does some consulting work. And, and he's the kind of guy that, that uh, loves getting out there and, and seeing the new trends that are going on and, and helping people out in this industry. Um, I would say I'm probably the better looking of the two, uh, <laughs> but he's certainly got more experience. So it balances out really nicely. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so Mark, um, I mean, I guess as Richard alluded to, I mean, you kind of stumbled into the crane industry, right? But you absolutely followed your father into the media business. Yeah, I mean, my father worked for um, a, an advertising agency in London through the 60s. He started at a company called Smith's, which at the time was the oldest advertising agency in London. Um, he went on to work for another company called Interad, which was based on Fleet Street. And in those days, all the national newspapers were out of Fleet Street, not like now. Um, I didn't really know what course I wanted to do. You know, I was in my early twenties. I wanted to get into sales and, you know, it was really by chance. Dad was talking to a sales rep. He was looking for somebody to come in at a fairly junior level. So I, in 1990, I found myself working on a magazine called Sheet Metal Industries selling classified advertising. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so that's really how I, I stumbled into the media industry, if you like. My dad got me my first interview. Okay. So does that mean it was the path of least resistance or did you get the bug early on through your dad's association? Yeah, I mean, dad, when dad left Fleet Street, he set up his own agency and he worked from home with my mother. So, you know, myself and my sisters growing up, Obviously, we were in and around advertising and magazines coming through the door and sales reps turning up and, and stuff like that. And my dad used to travel a little bit to trade shows, you know, mainly in Europe. Um, it seemed like a really, well, at the time, it was a really vibrant, exciting industry, certainly a very social one. I think most Friday afternoons, well, most lunchtimes are in the pubs in London and Friday afternoons, I don't think anybody went back to work. So... I'm not saying it was the drinking that sort of in, in excited me so much, but it just seemed like a really, really cool industry to get into. And obviously when you know, you'll know yourself in those days, you don't get to choose which industry you work in. Mine was sheet metal. That's because there was an opportunity there, but just to sort of on the lifting subject, I used to travel around and look at, go to lots of these fabrication plants, and in those days, it was management DMAG with the yellow cranes in every single building. And I remember hounding DMAG, trying to get them to advertise, but you know they were sticking to the traditional lifting books. And yeah, um, yeah nowadays that's changed, obviously. A lot of these crane businesses, are, you see them in lots of different end user magazines from different market sectors. Yeah, okay. And, and Tad, I mean, similar pattern for you I mean did you find yourself sort of going to the office with your father and and that's how you got into it certainly my dad and grandfather were were uh, really wonderful role models a, a young man couldn't ask for much more out, out of some guys that taught you how to play golf and and you know look another grown-up in the eye and and treat them with respect and and you know listen more than you speak so um uh, they started bringing me into the office and, and uh, as a little boy, I, I really, uh, you know, little boys are supposed to 
like you know trains and airplanes in our our culture right uh so i went in there and there's these big cranes and and forklifts and and semi trucks out in the in the building and I thought oh this is pretty cool and before you know it they start bringing me in giving me things to do and and uh, i said well geez you know maybe i should work here like like y'all do um and, and that was this was at a very early age when when really thinking about a career isn't something that most people do but once you start sweeping the floors and and uh, picking up trash and and you know once you get to your teenage years and you start help loading trucks and things like that it, it was just a natural progression and I really enjoyed it there was uh, to Mark's point there was uh, some really great camaraderie there where um, you know you made some friends that you wouldn't have made otherwise and and um, it, there really wasn't a lot of thought otherwise just that this is where I'm going and I enjoy it and I like these people so got you Okay, and thanks, Tad. And and Rich, when did you get the bug? I mean, I know you started out in journalism. Yeah, it's an interesting one, really, because I kind of didn't didn't follow um, my my father's career path. I've got a very very good relationship with my dad. He's my best friend, always has been, and you know we we drinking partners, you know, to to this day. And but he was a numbers numbers guy. Um, Academically very bright, very astute, very, very kind of a very savvy bloke, but he and numbers was his thing. He was he was an accountant. So he was never given my uh, maths grades at school. I was never in any danger of following him into into that sector. But he was pretty pretty rounded individual and, and actually um he he could uh, could string a sentence together and his, his writing was very good and I always remember as a kid that he used to get these blue books from um, fr from work and, and he would hand write a diary and um, it, I don't know how old I was when he when he stopped doing it but it was just kind of part of my childhood that my dad would kind of sit there and, and, and write in his journal and I was always fascinate, fascinated by the way that he um, uh, the, the way that he he would you know read them out and, and looking at his handwriting and he always used to show me this thing on his on his knuckle and he used to say that you know that damn knuckle I've got there because is because of the way he used to hold the pen he used to grip the pen really tightly and press really hard and you could see the impression four pages underneath in his diary where he was where he was writing and I don't know how much of that kind of was the reason I ended up going in, into journalism. But I definitely, as someone I looked up to, it, it left a real um, impression on me that uh, kind of words were obviously one, a, um, a kind of something that he had the ability to kind of string together and he wanted to share his work and read his journal entries out to people. But also, and where I absolutely, I, I, I did have, have this in common with him, is that he clearly thought it was an effective way of, of getting his thoughts down and, and getting his emotions across. And particularly as a, as a kid, when I kind of struggled, um, you know, in a, in a number of facets of life to, to, to try to kind of uh, be heard, I guess. I, I, I certainly had that influence in my dad who took to his diary. And I was, I was never, never tempted to, to, to write a journal, but definitely um, saw, saw words as a way of um, kind of expressing myself. And then, you know, one, as you, you said in your introduction, kind of one thing led to another, really. And Wordsmither has kind of been the one, the, the, the one constant pretty much from my um, uh, career at, at the start all the way to, to now. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, I started out as a journalist and then kind of fell into the materials handling market. And uh, really, over the last 20 odd years, materials handling and the lifting industry has bizarrely been a constant in my life and uh, and, it, and it's funny how some of us just fall into this game um so so what do we think about being past the baton i mean that does it make someone more apathetic do we think or uh, is it something that we end up taking for granted if that's our routine maybe less driven what i'd say you say guy i mean the other the other fellas are probably better off taking that question but from from someone who hasn't necessarily followed a, a, a father into a, a a line of work um there's many different types of second third fourth generation owner isn't there and we all know plenty of them and um okay not only is 
he's Tad the better looking one in his family, but he's, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's a great guy and he gets it and he kind of, as you put it, takes the bat and then he's absolutely run with it. We all know plenty of kind of second, third generation owners who, who haven't done that. Um, so it, and it's been interesting working with the various different different types, good and bad, and and the challenges that um, that that that, that rep represents. So yeah, no, that's a fair point, Rich and um, uh, Tad. Yes, I mean, obviously, you know, man and boy, so to speak. You've been in the industry. Um, how many of your immediate buddies, or as you were growing up in the industry, have you seen that are, are really similar to you in the in the respect that they have? Growing up around this industry and growing up with this industry, you know that's that's a, a great question. There's been quite a few guys my age now that are that are moving into leadership positions at, at their family company or or starting their own firm, um, and I find we all have had different and interesting paths uh, to get here. Uh, very few guys just said, "I love Dad's Crane Company, and I want to go work there." Uh, Quite a few guys intended on on going somewhere else. Um, you know, most of these guys have been through university and and uh, had full intents of becoming a banker, or uh, you know, someone who works in a in a fancy office downtown. And and I think that that uh, leads to an interesting point that at least in the United States, I don't know about the EU, uh, the culture over the last thirty years has said you you have to get a university degree or two or three and then. Uh, go work in a place where where they come up with good ideas and have fancy titles, um, and and it has been really to the detriment of our national economy and our culture because a lot of guys can earn a very honest, if not uh, extremely lucrative, living, um, and and perhaps be an outside dog, so to speak. You know, there's there's uh, it's very interesting and enlightening and and uh, uh, rewarding to spend time in steel mills or shipyards or crane factories. Um, and I think a lot of guys found that out uh, the long way, the hard way, if you will, because after university, they said, all right, well, I'll, I'll come back and work for dad or, you know, I'm, I've, I've worked for five or 10 years outside of school and now I want uh, to make a career change. And dad says, hey, come back. I need a little help. Um, and somebody starts to realize by the time they're 28 or 32 that, hey, maybe material handling and, and industry might be a, a great place for me to be rather than clocking an eight to five at an office uh and and working for the man um sure and, I and get that. there's there's also a lot of people in our industry that uh maybe are in ownership or family but but found a great job whether it's being a machinist or a crane uh, mechanic or a crane assembler that we're told all through uh, the u.s public education system that they that they have to uh, get a job and work in an office and realize that that wasn't for them. Uh, we do a real disservice to our people by not giving them a fuller picture of career options. And what that results in, as anybody in Cranes know, is a, a gaping hole where we need people, uh, skilled, either skilled trades or, or people who are uh, very skilled at selling cranes and, and communicating on the factory floor that, that really needs filled up. Um, and it's, it's not, these aren't bad jobs. These are great jobs. People make an honest living, if not a, a truly lucrative living doing these things. So. I, amen, Tad. And I completely echo that sentiment. Mark. What, yeah. What I, I just, I really have got a question for Tad. Um, yes. I, as I said earlier, you know, you don't get to choose which magazine you work on. And I worked on sheet metal. Then I went into wastewater and I sort of, needed a job, had a contact, and I ended up working at Cranes Today magazine. And I remember, you know, when I got the job, I was in the pub on a Friday night with my buddies. And I said, hey, look, I've got this job working for a crane magazine. And they sort of all burst out laughing. And then I was getting comments like, oh, that's going to be a really uplifting experience. And I'm sure you're going to rise to the top in that. And they, you know, I, I remember sort of saying, oh, well, you know, I'm going to do it for six months and I, and then I'll look for something else. And like Rich said earlier, I got sucked into it. And here we are 16 years later having this, having this great conversation on lifting load down. But my question really is when you are in out with your buddies or when you meet people or, you know, you're chatting to a girl in a bar or whatever, how do people sort of respond to you when you say, yeah, I'm in cranes. I mean, do they think, Oh, that's interesting. Or, 
you know, is it, it's sort of viewed as not really being a, an exciting industry, but actually it really is. So I just wondered really what your experiences are across the pond, so to speak. So if you're familiar with, uh, what is that, the four stages of grief where there's denial and anger and acceptance, uh, when, when it's similar to that when you meet people for the first time, they say, oh, what business are you? And you, you, know, you have a finance degree, are you, are you in banking? Are you in law? What, what do you do? I said, I'm in cranes. And they said, oh, okay, so like, like the big things that pick things up on a construction site. And it's like, no. So, so is it like the ones that go way up on the skyscrapers? Like, no. And so, well, no, these are the, they're kind of like bridges, but they're gantry cranes and they, they go into steel mills and shipyards and steel distribution centers. And at that point, the eyes gloss over and, and you, you give up and you, you uh, make that unfortunate, but, but accurate comparison to the stuffed animal crane at the grocery. And, and immediately people understand you, but, but people, and this, this is a really sad thing in our culture. People really don't think things get made anymore. I, I really have so many close friends that have furniture and automobiles and couldn't tell you where they're made. And, and we drive through the steel mills in Gary, Indiana, near, near home where I grew up outside of Chicago. And it's like, oh, those are gross. Those are, I don't know why we have those anymore. They're outdated and they're gross. And it's like, no, the car you have came from a coil of steel made in that building. So uh, anyway, back to the, the, you know, the, the four stages of grief, uh, the four stages of knowing people that, that are in the crane business. The first stage is tr just trying to explain to them what in the heck uh, uh, an EOT or bridge crane is. And then they just, they're like, okay, you know, he's my drinking buddy. We, we, uh, we give him a little guff about being in a crane business that we don't really understand. And by the time someone's your good friend, and I, I'm really fortunate to have some, some great friends, you know, they, they know who you are. They know you don't go to an office. They, they see some really interesting pictures on Instagram of, you know, whether you're catching the sunset over a shipyard or, or uh, watching them pour at a, at a steel mill. They're interested. They know you do something really cool. They have, they have more questions than answers, but they kind of accept that, uh, that, that big gray area. You know, they, people have no idea what you actually do, how much money you make. Is it a dangerous place? And, and I'm, we've all kind of come to a nice medium where they're just like, you know, it's, it's Ted, don't worry about it. He's, he's a good guy in cranes and he's always down for a couple beers and, and uh, you know, he, he's a, he's a half decent sportsman. And, and so we'll, we'll go do something this weekend. Um, so I, I, I think we've all come to a normal, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We've all we've all accepted our our fate, and yeah. uh, not that I go around chatting up girls in bars these days. That's long behind me. But uh, yeah, maybe Cranes isn't the best in. Um, <laughs> so um, I mean, obviously the US has a has a great um, history of, of manufacturing, and it certainly used to be the cornerstone of of uh, the UK economy. Uh, that's obviously a lot less now. Um, Rich, I mean, what, what's your feelings on this? I mean, you, you've obviously interviewed lots of people over the years. Um, are you seeing less people kind of coming into the industry through this route? Are, are people sort of falling into it as, should we say, you and I certainly did more often than not these days? I think there's a, a, a consistency really, Guy, and I think that's part of our problem really. I, I don't think from a recruitment standpoint we're really making great, great strides. Um, I still think there's a lot of mis, uh, you know, mis, misconceptions about this, um, about this industry. Um, I'm meeting a lot more dynamic younger people, um, so I suppose that's changing. Certainly on the marketing side, there's some really good good young uh, marketing talent it's certainly been been good to to see a lot more young uh, young women coming into the sector you, you walk around some shows now and, and it is a little bit it is a little bit more diverse um, which is which is good to see but we, they're very small steps to be honest with you I don't see us making any real you know, fast moving change, and, and that's what that's what the the global lifting awareness day set out to kind of sure. uh, change, didn't it? Um, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, uh, but you know, and I just I think it, you know, as as, as Tad saying there, it, it's we, we we can become terribly apologetic, can't we, when we're discussing this industry? And I think that's probably gets us off on the on the on the wrong foot and, and I think maybe we could all take it aboard ourselves to try and sell the sell the sector a little bit a little bit better. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I mean, I agree. And this sort of brings me on to another point, I guess, uh, an initiative that LHI is proud to be associated with is Leah's school engagement program, the Think Lifting project. Um, and it appears to have tapped into a zeitgeist that matches a need to inspire the next generation. But a question for all of you, um, how else can we promote this vital yet unglamorous sector to future career professionals? Tad? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, number one, one of our biggest uh, uh, areas that we need people is, is crane mechanics, crane machinists. We call them crane techs here in the States. And overall, the United States has done an F minus job of, of helping people get into trade schools and, and um, we, whatever mechanism was in place in the 60s and 70s to get people into trade school should be back in place uh, or perhaps something better uh, and expose uh, some young men and women to opportunities to uh, get a really good lucrative job that whether or not it's a, a you know, a five-year place where you, you learn a, a trade in an industry and then either go to university or, or graduate into the office or it's a, a lifelong career uh, which has uh, been a, a great opportunity for a, a number of friends of mine. Um, we need to make people more aware of that. On, on the office side, recruiting good people to be in the office for the crane industry is, is so tough. And because we're such a tight knit group, uh, I see some people being um, brought in from, from the factory or the, uh, the, the repair side with, with mm. decent results. I see um, a lot of times people bring in their friends. Some of the best success stories I've seen in this business, I, a couple of my best friends have been in the business for a while, um, is, hey, I've got a friend that works for XYZ Crane Company and he's making decent money, having fun. He's always got some great stories. He's always very engaged in his work. Uh, it's, it's not a soulless, boring place to be. It's, it's really engaging. And so I think I've seen um, a lot of that. So I think Global Lifting Awareness Day, which, which I advocate to be a week next year, uh, <laughs> is, is a, a lovely tool for, for people to get on social media and say, hey, here's what I do. I go to places that that are very interesting. We get to play with big toys. We get to put together very interesting deals with, with you know, prestigious companies like Boeing or United States Steel or Ford Motor Company. And I do this, I really enjoy it. I think my friends should take a look at this. If, if you're perhaps in, in your 30s or 40s and considering a career change, maybe don't drop off resumes at all the big firms downtown. Maybe, maybe look at some material handling companies because they're great opportunities. No, I, I get you. I mean, something that, that um, Rich said in the, in the last episode was that he didn't foresee himself coming into this industry, but now he can't see himself leaving. Mark, I mean, that's probably same, the same for you too, is it not? Absolutely. I mean, I sort of mentioned that a few minutes ago, you know, when I said to my friends, you know, you know I'll do it for six months, but... Um, I've really enjoyed this industry and I've met so many great, you know, four of us have a wonderful time when we get together. Um, but I've met some great people, made some really good friends. I've met some people that have retired and I'm still friends with them on Facebook. And, um, you know, we've all traveled the world. We've all seen some wonderful countries and um, things that we probably wouldn't have seen in another industry. Um, but it's, it is very incestuous um, and um, it's a big family. Um, is, that, is, is that because the talent pool's so small? I don't really know. Um, I don't really know how to answer that question. But I mean, one of the other guys might be better placed. But the industry really brings you in. There's a lot of great characters, there's a lot of interesting people. Um, and, you know, when, when we're back traveling and going to trade shows, that's part of the part of the sort of job that I really enjoy getting in amongst it, you know, sharing experiences, having dinners. Um, and um, like I said, it's a very, very warm industry and, and a great place to work. Um, I'd encourage anybody to, to look at opportunities and um, unfortunately, Kids nowadays want to do stuff with computers and yeah, you know, well, look, 
I agree with you, mate. I mean, you know, it, we're, we're all living in the X factor generation, aren't we? And um, I think, you know, when you ask young people, um, not wanting to tar them all with, with a brush, it's, you know, what do you want to be? And they want to be famous or rich or a YouTube influencer or something. And really, you're looking at a job for life, aren't you, if you come into this sector? Absolutely. But, you know, obviously, I was working at Cranes today. Rich joined shortly afterwards. We never met before. There's a you know, fairly big 14 year age gap between us. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, but you know, you pretty much went on your first overseas trip with me to Paris. And we, I remember sitting in a, in a bar in, in Paris saying to you, look, I need somebody to get on board with, with me here. And, you know, we can, we can really do something with this magazine. And, and, and Rich did that and he took the opportunity and, you know, we ended up leaving that company, going to work for an American company together. Um, and then, you know, here we are now working together as business partners for a PR company that specializes in, in lifting equipment. And that's how we met Tad when he was working at Ace World, you know. So this is a great example. And obviously we went on to meet you when you um, and, and your fellow directors bought Lift and Noise International. So sure. this is a good example of how you can travel the world, meet different people, interesting people, and, and, and you know, make lifelong friends. Absolutely. And, and we all have that camaraderie, don't we, when we get together, whether it's, you know, La Quinta or whether it's stateside, meet up with Tad and some of the other guys. It's, you know, we're not, we're not quite pen pals, but, you know, we're good buddies when we hook up. I remember, yep, that, fine, I remember that bar well, the frog and roast beef in, in Paris at the top of Rue <laughs> Saint-Denis. I don't remember too much about leaving it that day, but I, I think that that's a good point because while it, the engineers and the guys get get can get too technical about some, some of our kit, and I've never been kind of, never been, I'm not an engineer, I've never pretended to understand, you know, every single nut and bolt, but... This industry is just for, for, the, for the people and, and the global travel and, and the diversity of end user marketplaces and challenges. There's a real, real selling point there. We could get too, um, too stuck on the kind of uprights and the, and the cross section of a, of a gantry and less about the kind of global fun marketplace that it, that it actually is in real terms. Well, let's hope some, some young folks, you know, who are still trying to pick out a career end up listening to this podcast and they're enthused by what they, what, you know, what they're, what they're listening to. Tad, you wanted to come yes. in with something. Yeah. So I think uh, Mark unveiled a, 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 a clear fallacy here that, that needs to be brought <laughs> about and, and addressed full frontally is that That's you know, young, young people want to do computers and tech things. Uh, and, and that's the glamour profession these days. And, and that, that's a false uh, uh, equivalency that cranes are not technological. There's no computers involved. Mm. The, the, uh, the stereotype of a crane guy is a crusty guy in an office with a slide rule or an old adding machine and, and a large blueprint, you know, the size of the desk or, or of a mechanic getting his fingers dirty. And um, we've seen so many leaps and bounds in the last 10 years with, with computers and technology and, and, internet of things in this business if you want to be an internet or a web developer a software developer if you want to develop apps if you want to be at the forefront of a technological revolution come to cranes because we have so much cool stuff going on here right now our, our company airpez is making so many cool uh, technologies for monitoring crane behavior and, and big data analysis um, one of my closest friends in this business who i think is a, a wonderful human being and an utter genius told me uh, when he was much younger, he said, well, I want to be an engineer for, for something like Ford or Tesla and, and work on either race cars or, or rockets or something. And I said, that sounds great. You know, let me know how he's a little bit younger than I'm. I said, let me know how university goes and, and if I can help you. And before you know it, he finds himself in cranes um, working in, in a, a very technologically oriented part of the business and, and doing wonderful and having a career that he's proud of and, and making decent money and uh, having the, the trappings that come with that success of, of good hobbies. Um, I think that it was a very pleasant surprise where he perhaps didn't expect one. Um, and and that's, that's a message that needs to go to every university and, and high school student in, in the world is that, you know, there is 
there's wonderful opportunities with technologies and internet and computer and software in heavy industry. Don't, don't imagine that the only guys having fun are working in San Francisco or Seattle for Elon. Yeah, no, I completely see that. And um, we, we've seen massive shifts towards technological advances, as you say, the, you know, internet of things and automation. I mean, it's all out there and it's really blossoming now. And I think our registry is going to look radically different in 20 years time. And there's no reason why young people who have the interest in, in cranes or computers, sorry, computers or technology can't be attracted to the cranes industry or yeah. the materials handling industry. Um, so let's start to wrap this up guys. I mean, the last, you know, last question to you all. So, 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 so which is best, you know, legacy or do we want new blood people who have no experience of it in 20, in 20 seconds, if you can, Rich. Oh, even less than that guy will do it for you. A mixture of both hundred percent. You know, of course people should, should extend their, their family uh, connections is in this industry, but you know, let's do a, a better job at, at getting some, some new talent in as well. Great. Mark. Yeah, I think in terms of um, following your dad into the business, that can sometimes just naturally happen because, it, it, you know, that's how the companies evolve. Um, so, um, yeah, I think new blood, really. It's raising the profile of the business to the people that don't understand anything about it. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And, and Tad, last word. Absolutely new blood. And, and uh, with the caveat that family can be new blood, it, it just has to be, you, you have to understand the business. You have to really love what we do. You have to realize that we're playing with technology and the coolest big toys and, and man, the, the, the personalities are engaging. And, and, and I know of two people that have left this industry in my whole life that were, were potential lifers. Everybody else stays here for better, or for worse. Um, I think new blood is, is absolutely vital to this industry. Well, I think that says everything. And, and I can't thank you enough for joining me on Lifting Lowdown. Go, Wells, guy, go well, guys, and speak to you soon. Be safe. Uh, Thanks, guys. Day. All the best. You know what? As time moves on, I think we may be getting better at this, even if I say so myself. A massive thank you to Rich, Mark and Tad for giving up their time and sharing their stories and insights. I hope you found it an easy and interesting 30 minutes. Maybe not surprisingly, the takeaway from this episode is that absolutely there is room for new blood as well as handed down experience in our sector. But clearly, we're all agreed that no matter how it comes, our industry depends on new lifting professionals, as well as our profession isn't a stuffy one, but essential and one changing with the times. If this podcast gets only one new person, young or otherwise, engaged, then I think we'd settle for that. As ever, Feel free to leave comments or present any questions for me and our guests. Your feedback and suggestions for future editions will enable us to make this podcast even more relevant and interesting. You can keep up to date with the latest industry news by visiting LHI's website, liftandhoist.com. Thanks for listening and look out for the next episode in a couple of weeks. Until then, stay safe. Stay safe.